and good afternoon, everybody. We've got an audience joining us from around the world today, and so welcome to another broadcast here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got a lot of familiar faces in the crowd today, but if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I really want to thank you because we are in our home stretch here, our final two weeks of broadcast after doing over 150 since the school year began. And I really wanna thank you for joining us as we continue to showcase and celebrate some of the coolest people and places on this planet. Now today, before we go live, I'm gonna do this at the proper time in the intro this time, we are gonna have a Kahoot. So if you wanna join us between our talk and our Q&A, have a little bit of fun, test your understanding, a win bragging rights from Jamie and I, that is gonna be our game pin. I'll make sure that's in the chat for absolutely everyone. It's a nice way to keep it extra interactive. Now today we are joined by one of my very favorite educators around the world, and that is Jamie with Friends of the Rainforest. Friends of the Rainforest is all about trying to inspire you, children especially, to care to, uh, about the rainforest, to take action, to protect and expand it. Uh, so we've had a bevy of broadcasts of them, five, six now, something like that. You can check all those out on our YouTube channel. Uh, we've got a lot of spectacular programs that are on rainforest generally if you want to keep the learning going. But today, we are going to dive in with a special theme, something we've almost never done here at Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants, and that is butterflies. So I'm going to stop talking. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie to blow your minds and uh, show you some of the most amazing creatures and places on this planet. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jamie. I work with Friends of the Rainforest. And yeah, we're going to dive into the world of butterflies today, which I'm very excited about. Uh, so I'm going to pull up my slides for you here. Jesse, would you be willing to pull up the um, the slides, not this video? Nope, this is the slides. These are them. They're just on oh, slide 10. Great. Take us back. Right. <laughs> so like, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Perfect. We're going to talk about butterflies of the rainforest today. So a roadmap for today, Jesse touched on this, but uh, I'll talk a little bit about Friends of the Rainforest and what we do, and then we'll dive into butterflies, talk about their life cycle, um, host plants and host plant conservation, um, butterflies, uh, many ways of uh, defending themselves against predators. We'll have a short Kahoot quiz, and then we'll move into the Q&A portion. So Friends of the Rainforest, um, we are based in um, St. Louis, Missouri, but we partner with a rainforest preserve in Costa Rica. So we work to educate students and adults around the world to um, take action to protect the rainforest wherever they are. Um, and so we do this by raising money to uh, fill grants for the needs of the researchers in Costa Rica. We do this by um, facilitating eco tours. So sending schools down to the rainforest to stay um, in the field stations and, and work alongside the staff there. And then we, uh, engage folks in education and outreach like this. Um, I really love sharing the story about this rainforest preserve. So the children's eternal rainforest is a really magical place because it was started by children. So this is a photo of uh, Swedish teacher Iha Kern's class in about the 1980s. Um, so around this time in the 1980s, there was a lot of deforestation happening around the Monte Verde area of Costa Rica. And uh, a lot of it was due to farming and agriculture. Now there are ways to farm in harmony with nature and then there are ways to farm that harm nature. And a lot of the farming that was happening around this time was the latter, the harmful kind. And so a group of citizens um, and community members in the Monte Verde area banded together and they started a conservation group to try to protect the rainforest around where they live. Uh, and a researcher who was working there visited this class and was talking about this project that these Monte Verde residents were engaged in. And one of the students in this class had an idea to have a bake sale fundraiser and see if they could raise money to purchase more land to add on to the preserve. So they had a, a bake sale. You may have done a bake sale or a similar fundraiser at your own school, but they raised actually enough money to buy a little piece of land adjacent to the land that the Monte Verde Conservation League already had. And so they were able to grow this preserve. And word spread about what these kids had done, and they inspired students in 44 different countries across the world to have their own fundraisers and add on to what kind of became this patchwork quilt of properties that became the children's eternal rainforest. So now it's over 56,000 acres. It is a massive preserve that bumps up against some other preserved areas. So it's a huge area where nature can just exist uh, and animals can live freely. So here's some pictures from the preserve. Uh, this is a view of the volcano Arenal that's nearby. 
another view of the preserve. You can see those just rolling green hills that seem to go on forever. Uh, we had the opportunity to visit myself, staff, and uh, board members and community members just this past August. So if you have any questions about that during the q and I'd be happy to talk about my time in the rainforest. Here we are there. Um, and this preserve is really special because it, it captures a lot of different habitats within the rainforest. So you can get a view of lots of different biological niches for different animals, like butterflies. Um, when we talk about habitats in the rainforest, it's helpful to classify them um, in these different ways. So I have listed here, the forest floor refers to things on the ground and in the ground. Um, so animals that make their habitats there. And a lot of animals, they, they spend their time in the layer where they find their food and their shelter. Uh, next up, we have the understory. So bushes and shrubbery. If you were walking through the rainforest, it would be the plants around eye level. You have lots of flowering plants in the understory. So this is where we're gonna find a lot of pollinators like butterflies. Moving up, we have the canopy layer, the branches of the trees where you'll find things like birds and sloths and monkeys. And then the emergent layer uh, is the tippy tops of trees and then emerging into the sky above. So lots of things with wings up there, more butterflies, insects, birds. Um, but we're gonna be focusing on butterflies today. So I'm gonna pull up the video. Jesse's gonna pull up the video, excellent. So we're gonna become butterfly scientists for the day or lepidopterists. The order Lepidoptera describes butterflies and moths and it contains over 180,000 different species. The differences between butterflies and moths can be challenging to tease out. Um, a lot of times the characteristics that separate them have exceptions, um, but there's some key differences. So as adults, um, adult butterflies you see in this video here, um, a lot of the wing colors are brighter and more vibrant than in moths. Um, butterflies typically have longer bodies than moths. Um, butterfly wings fold straight up over their body, whereas moth wings generally kind of fold in like a, like a tent. Um, butterfly um, bodies and antenna are generally smooth while moths tend to be like appear hairier. And there's some differences in their life cycle as well. Um, so this is a, a life cycle of a butterfly. They start off as an egg uh, and adult butterflies lay their eggs on like one family or one type of plant. And we'll, we'll get to the importance of that in a moment. Um, and then they hatch from their egg into a caterpillar. Um, the caterpillar stage lasts a couple of weeks. During this stage, a butterfly's only job is to eat as much as possible. And they are eating, 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 eating as much as they can of their host plant, the plant that they are adapted to eat. And they will eat so much that they will kind of, they'll grow out of their exoskeleton. So they'll need to shed their exoskeleton several times as their body uh, mass increases uh, many times over. Um, as caterpillars, moth caterpillars generally appear hairier than butterfly caterpillars. Once they've kind of reached the point where they have enough energy stored, their um, bodies have grown a few times in size, they'll form a chrysalis. But for butterflies, it's usually a hard shell chrysalis. And they'll stay in the chrysalis for um, like one to two weeks, but they can also stay in for longer if they're in an extreme weather environment that requires them to stay inside safe for a little bit longer. Um, and so once they hatch, and then while they're in their chrysalis, they completely liquefy. So they're not a caterpillar. They're not yet a butterfly. When they're in their, the middle of their metamorphosis, they are just like a genetic goo. So they retain all of their DNA and all their genetic information. They also, interestingly, retain their memories. So when they hatch as an adult butterfly, they may remember experiences that they had as a caterpillar. And studies have, science, uh, studies have um, scientists have done studies on this effect where they've trained a response in caterpillars, a, like a response to a certain smell, for example. And when that butterfly emerges from its chrysalis and senses that same smell, it'll have that same conditioned response. 
and we're still learning about kind of how that all works. So then as an adult butterfly, they'll live um, generally two to four weeks, um, but some can live for like nine months to a year, depends on the species. Um, and then the adult butterflies, uh, um, when they're ready to lay their eggs, they are going to be searching for that host plant, that one type of plant that their caterpillars are adapted to eat. If they don't find their host plant, their caterpillars are not going to be able to get the food that they need. So over time, that could destabilize a population. If caterpillars are not, not able to get food, they will die before they enter their chrysalis stage. So butterflies are insects. They have six legs. They have a head, thorax, and abdomen. Um, they're often polymorphic, meaning they uh, members of the same species appear in multiple colors or forms. Um, however, there's a lot more to their coloration than meets the eye. So you can see this picture uh, over here, which shows these close-up pictures of wings, and you can see these scale structures that are in the butterfly's wings. Um, so the scales are made out of a material called uh, chitin, and um, there's some kind of smoother layers and then some rougher layers, and it kind of acts like a prism, and it uh, reflects and reflect, uh, refracts light. Thanks, Jesse. And that forms the, the colors that we see. So it's not a chemical pigment or dye. It's just this um, like crystal-like structure of their wings that reflects the light that creates the colors that we see. So I've touched on this, but caterpillars are like the world's pickiest eaters. They have one type of plant that they eat. I have behind me, I have some examples of rainforest butterflies and their host plants. So we've got uh, the glass wing butterfly. It's very hard to see. We'll talk about this guy in a moment here, uh, which eats the lantana plant, uh, the blue morpho, which eats... Um, plants from the Macuna or the pea family, like, um, and then um, up on the slides here, if I can get back, there we go. Um, I've got milkweed, which is the host plant for monarch butterflies. If you live in a place where uh, monarch butterflies live, you may have heard about the importance of growing milkweed in your garden. Uh, I've got the passion vine, which is the host plant of the heliconia butterfly. So it's really important that butterflies are able to find their host plants because again, if they can't find their host plants out in the wild, their caterpillars are not going to have food. So in this way, plant conservation is an integral part of butterfly conservation. We need to make sure that these plants are around to feed the butterflies. Um, so that's caterpillars and what they eat. Um, and there we go, cool. Here's some videos of adult butterflies feeding. So you can see they're sticking their proboscis, their kind of straw-like appendage down into flowers to get the nectar. And then there's some videos. So some, some butterflies will um, like drink the nectar from flowers, some like uh, the juices from rotting fruit. So you can see these butterflies here are enjoying some rotten bananas. Um, some butterflies, you can see that flash of blue. You can tell that that's a blue morpho. So that's the underside of a blue morpho. And then the bright blue is on the back side of the wings. Some butterflies will um, like uh, eat the, the minerals out of dirt. Um, so their, their food really depends on the species and what kind of minerals that they need. And we can move forward through this. We don't have to play the whole thing. Okay. So how does a butterfly protect itself? They seem like these just small, delicate, magical creatures, and they are. They also have a myriad of ways that they defend themselves against predators like birds. Um, so one of those is aposomatism. So this is like a clue or an advertisement to predators that that animal is not worth attacking or eating. Um, so those defenses might include, they might be toxic or poisonous if they've accumulated biotoxins. Some caterpillars are able to eat plants that are poisonous to other animals and it does not kill them. Instead, that toxin becomes integrated into their body. So if another animal eats them, then they are toxic to that animal. Um, some other animals like porcupines employ like sharp spines. Some have stingers. 
Um, so a lot of these animals have visual clues to train their predators, hey, don't eat me. Um, so some of those clues include bright colors like um, on some poisonous frogs or coral snakes. Um, the yellow and black markings that are shared by wasps and bees are also indicators that that animal can sting you. Sometimes those signals are auditory. You can hear them like in rattlesnakes, they'll rattle their tail if they feel threatened. So there's a couple of different uh, ways that this manifests. So um, wasps and bees, we talked about how they share that striped pattern. Because they share that pattern, it's easier for predators to know, predators to know okay, that pattern means this animal can sting. When animals that have the same defense mechanism mimic each other, they copy each other, we call that Mullerian mimicry. Sometimes an animal that is not harmful, it does not have that defense, will copy and, and its body has evolved to look like an animal that has a defense mechanism. So in this case, this is called Batesian mimicry. The hoverfly is another insect that looks a lot like a bee or a wasp, but a hoverfly does not sting. It just looks like it does. So in that way, it's able to trick predators and keep itself safe. So we can see examples of different mimicry and butterflies. So for example, the monarch butterfly eats milkweed, which con contains a toxin. The toxin does not kill the caterpillar, but it does get integrated into the body. So when an animal eats a monarch butterfly, it gets sick. The vice fry butterfly is not poisonous, but it's evolved over time to look very, very similar to a monarch butterfly. So in this way, it can trick its predators into thinking that it's the poisonous monarch. And then Mullerian mimicry, where um, harmful species copy each other. This is a small sampling of uh, the heliconian butterflies. It's a huge family of butterflies that all kind of mimic each other. So they have very, like the wing shapes are pretty similar and the patterns share a lot of similarities, but these butterflies can still tell each other apart because though there's like over 40 different species of heliconia butterflies, they don't really, um, they don't really interbreed. So those species stay when they find a mate or a partner, they partner just within their species. They don't um, intermix with other species of Heliconia butterflies. Um, and again, sharing that same signal, um, these, these ones also contain a toxin. So sharing that same signal helps them train predators not to eat them. Um, sometimes butterflies will um, mimic themselves. Um, so when an animal disguises part of its body to look like a different body part, and a, an example of this is the false eyes, um, these eye spots along the outer edges of the wing. So this is the underside of a blue moral butterfly. You saw them eating the bananas in the previous video. These false eyes um, are meant to trick predators. If they're going to attack or eat, uh, try to eat a butterfly, it's a lot safer for the butterfly to get bit on the edge of its wing than it is uh, close to its head or body. So when it's kind of creating these false lures of like, okay, if you're going to attack me, attack me here, they're keeping it away from their vital organs, away from their head. Um, and then we have camouflage, which is another tool that butterflies employ, like this leaf mimic butterfly looks an awful lot like the underside of a leaf. And then the glass wing butterfly, which I showed you on my poster back here, uh, its form of camouflage is to have clear wings. So they're very hard to spot because their wings look like glass. They can, you can see through them. Um, and we have a fantastic craft, a guided craft video um, which Jesse, Jesse will share the links to some of these extra um, curriculum pieces and activities that you can opt in with your class if you're interested in uh, making a glass wing butterfly ring. And we talked about blue morphos and how um, their scales reflect the light. 
but this blue color also kind of serves as camouflage. So the underside of their wings you saw is that kind of dull color with the false eye spots. And um, then the, uh, under, the backside of their wings is this brilliant blue. So when they are flying through the air against the like brown forest floor understory background or against the bright blue sky, there are kind of moments where it seems to disappear. Um, and so it's harder for predators to track it. So here is another video that shows some examples of self mimicry and camouflage. So here is the backside and the underside of a blue morpho. And you can see these, as these butterflies are flying through the air, you can, there are moments where they just kind of are not as visible as they flap their wings. One key thing I forgot to mention about um, uh, mimics, especially mimics um, who are mimicking a harmful or a toxic um, butterfly species is it's really important if you are a species that uses um, uses toxins to train your predators not to eat you, you don't want to be so toxic that you kill your predator. If a butterfly was so toxic that it killed the bird that was trying to eat it, that bird would not live to train its offspring or to train other members of its social group not to eat that butterfly. So these toxins are designed to make their predators sick, but not die. Another way that butterflies protect themselves uh, is by communal roosting. So um, roosting together as a group. Um, and so it's kind of a, it's a deterrent against being preyed upon by birds in a study in Costa Rica and Panama found that when um, when butterflies of the Heliconia species, um, the Heliconia group were roosting in groups, there was a significant reduced risk of birds preying on them. Uh, and to do this, they created fake model butterflies and they grouped them in fake roosts of these like plastic butterflies that they made. And then they came back after a few days and they counted on the bodies, the, um, the bite marks or the beak marks from birds to determine if that butterfly would have lived or if it would have gotten preyed upon. So there is benefit to being a social butterfly. Um, the, birds, the butterflies that roosted in groups stayed safer. And part of this could also be because they were roosting with uh, groups of Mullerian mimics. So it was a large group that all appeared to be toxic. So big ideas here. Butterflies are incredibly biodiverse, especially in the rainforest. They have a wide range of colors, diets, lifespans, and adaptations to keep them safe. Forest and plant conservation is butterfly conservation. When we protect rainforest habitats, we protect the host plants that live in the rainforest, and we ensure that those butterflies are going to be able to find the food for their babies to continue the next generation. Additionally, um, wherever you live, you have the capacity to help butterflies by planting a butterfly garden. So look up the native butterflies in your area and you'll be able to um, find what kind of host plants those butterflies rely on. And then you can buy the seeds to plant those flowers so the butterflies in your community have food. You already have the power to make waves in conservation work. We heard about the kids who started this rainforest preserve. I like to show this map at the end of all my uh, talks about forest cover in Costa Rica and how it's changed over time. So you can see this low point in the 80s when the Monteverde Conservation League was formed and the kids in Iha Curran's class were starting that first bake sale fundraiser that, that um, triggered the, all these this domino effect of kids having their own fundraisers for the rainforest. We were at a low point of forest cover there. And over the years, the forest, total forest cover, so that's rainforest and other tree cover, has grown back up to more than half of Costa Rica is covered in forest now. So you already have that ability. 
Um, so what work can you do from where you are to save the rainforest? Continue to educate yourself and your community. Advocate for protected land and animals through your writing uh, or art. Engage in local sustainable action because local conservation is global conservation. And then staying optimistic and future focused. We know that this stuff works. Um, I sent Jesse about 20 different links of a bunch of different <laughs> a bunch of different uh, videos that we've done with our community partners, lessons that you can explore on your own time or with your class. Um, I love to go into classrooms around the St. Louis community. These are some uh, examples of lessons that I've worked on with kids about butterflies around here in St. Louis. So we'll just jump right into Kahoot now. Perfect. Well, I was just going to say, I will make sure all our classes have those links. If you registered for today's program, you're going to get a bevy of resources to keep the excitement going after this broadcast is done. Um, and thank you, Jamie, for such a spectacular program. As we're bringing up the Kahoot together, I'm going to pull this up on my screen for a minute. If you want to exit your screen shares in case they're distracting in any way, you're welcome to do that. Uh, but we're going to dive in with the Kahoot. For those who are new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get. Now, you don't win anything, but you do win Jamie and I everlasting respect. So uh, play along. We'd love to have you guys take part and i hope a butterfly name wins that's just my personal bias after today's program one other note just before we dive in with this you told the story of uh caterpillars basically liquefying before they become butterflies anyone who hears that and isn't just like distracted for the rest of the day hasn't really thought it through enough because it's one of the coolest things of all time so that's my my plug of the day 57 of you already in that's spectacular yeah. Um, I know my connection is going a little slower, so hopefully this all works the way it's supposed to, but we are going to get underway and dive in. Jamie, you can give us hints when there's a couple seconds to go in all these questions, okay? And then we're sure. going to come to Ms. Sussman's class first for questions when we dive in with our Q&A period. All right, three, two, one. Our first question with maybe a distracting image. A lepidopterist is someone who studies what? Leopards, butterflies and moths, yes. beetles, or plants? Da, 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 da. You're all lepidopterists today. Yeah. So maybe not leopards, even if there's a picture. It's too late to change your answer at this point. But I like to I like to have some fun. I can do whatever I want when I create the cahoots. Who got distracted by leopards? 35 of you got distracted by leopards. Oh no. Um 43 <laughs> of you were on the ball in our butterfly program. Very good. Um Fearless Boa is currently in our lead, barely over social bison. Let's go to question number two. I promise that's the only distracting image. Uh, butterflies with false eyes on their wings will likely have them where? Near their head, near their thorax, near the outer edges of their wings, or butterflies never have eye wing patterns and this butterfly picture is clearly a lie. Uh, we learned about this. Where would they want them best? And where does this one have them, perhaps? Hmm, tricky one when the image gives it away. Let's see. They 90. want to protect their vital organs. Oh, this is so many kids. 57 of you got this right near the outer edge of the wing. That's exactly where you want them because then only things that aren't really essential to you get eaten as opposed to your face. No one wants to have their face eaten. That uh, sucks when that happens. True or false? Number three, it's evolutionarily advantageous, say that five times fast, for an animal to be so poisonous it kills its predator. So you want to be so poisonous when something eats you, it just dies. Yes or no? We talked about this near the end. This is your bragging rights question, and and you might have to leave the room if you get it wrong. It might seem it might seem counterintuitive, but think it about is. how an animal is going to train its predator to not eat it. That's right. So most of you got this right. Way to go. So it is false. It's just like broccoli. I eat broccoli. It doesn't kill me, but it makes me never want to have it ever again. And uh, it's not because of poison. It's just because of flavor. Creative Swan. Oh, Quick Wolf takes our lead. We're just, we have this crazy, it's going all over the place, our leaderboard today. Going to our final question. How can you work to protect rainforest butterflies? And I'll give you a hint. If you've ever done a Kahoot with me before, it's the answer that's always in questions like this. But pay attention to the, the options here. Teach your friends and family about butterflies, plant a butterfly garden, raise awareness or funds to fight deforestation, or all of the above. Those all sound like pretty good options, Jamie. I think I'm like the 113. This is like a crazy. Most of you got this right. It is all of the above. So talking about the things that you learn, uh, putting space in your property for butterflies to land, and then getting people excited, uh, raising money for these efforts, like the Children's Eternal Rainforest, are all spectacular ways to help butterflies. So let's see our podium. Dun, 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 dun. Let us know who you are in the chat, if you are any of these people. This Creative Swan is third. 
weirdly ghosty for some reason. I don't know why. Fearless Boa is a panda, sure. And number one, barely. Oh, a tie, technically. Mighty Kitten wins. Two winners. Very good, guys. Thank Congratulations you so much. All of you. Yeah, seriously, what a great group of cahooters today. Uh, Miss Sussman's class, I'm going to come to you guys first uh, when my computer deigns to let me press the button to bring you in. But Compton, California, come on in, unmute your mic, and you are good to go. Hey, guys. Hi. Hi. Okay. We have two questions. The first one is from Abby. How do butterflies different colors? How are butterflies different colors? How do they how do they get it? How do they get their colors? Yeah, how does the colors? Good question. That's a great question. So we talked a little bit about um, the different scales within their wings that reflect light in different ways so that uh, it just registers differently to our eyes. Something even crazier though is butterflies have uh, compound eyes, so they have um, more receptors and can see more colors than we do. So a lot of butterflies can see a couple different types of ultraviolet light, which is just a different wavelength of light that we don't have the receptors for. Um, so as colorful as butterflies appear to our eyes, they appear even more colorful and even more complex to each other. So that's also how butterflies that look uh, similar, like all the butterflies, the orange and black butterflies uh, of the Heliconia group that I was showing, they look very similar to each other to our eyes. They probably appear more different to each other. I'm always glad when people mention this. I really encourage our classes. I don't know if it's in your resource pack or not, but look up butterflies and ultraviolet or even flowers and ultraviolet because they're so radically different. They're just extraordinary uh, if you have that ability to sense that. Uh, it's, it's so, so cool. Great question, guys. Ms. Sussman, I will come back to you for the second question. I promise we're going to do one person every round and then we'll come right back. Ms. Lou's class, welcome in. Uh, come on in and join us. Hey, guys. Hey, Hi. How long can they fly? How long can they fly? Yeah. How long can they fly? Um, well, in their adult stage, they'll usually live a few weeks. Um, but as far as how long can they fly, it depends species to species. Some spend their adult lives in kind of one localized environment. They might have everything they need in one small space. And so they spend those few weeks in one area. Um, other butterflies may migrate. So like the, the monarch butterflies migrate from um, like the Midwest and East Coast. So um, and uh, parts of Southern Canada. So I think where a lot of groups are calling from today um, have monarchs that live with them for part of the year. And then they make a Southern migration down to Mexico um, around fall. And they usually arrive in Mexico around Dia, Dia de los Muertos. And so um, there's a belief that the monarch butterflies carry the souls of like your family members who have passed back uh, for Day of the Dead. It's one of the most so, beautiful- butterflies by a long way. Yeah, I, I looked it up while you were talking because I'd never heard a specific question like this before. So 265 miles or about 400 kilometers is the longest a monarch has ever been recorded flying in one day. They actually put little tags in the monarchs are one of the most researched species in the world. And so uh, great question, Ms. Lewis Class and Milton, uh, who are very familiar with monarchs, by the way. I'm a Torontonian by birth and we're like teeming with monarchs when I was a kid. Um, we're going to head to Stony Plains Central. Uh, so come on in, Ms. Smith's class and take us away, mm -hmm. guys. Why are there different types of butterflies? Why not just one kind of butterfly, Jamie? <laughs> That's a fantastic question. I don't have an answer for that question. I encourage you to do your own research, but you know, there's there are many, many different types of species within lots of different animal groups. I think the best way to explain this is that, you know, if you have a species that gets to a new area like this, imagine this rainforest that's behind us in the picture here. Well, there's all sorts of different ways of making a living in that rainforest. And so as that organism gets there, it's going to change and adapt. And you're going to end up with tons of different species that now are able to exploit these different food sources, these different places, these different areas in the canopy. So we've seen this with animals all over the world, birds that end up on Hawaiian islands. We've seen this with fish in the lakes of Africa and butterflies. If a one kind of butterfly gets to a new forest, 
Well, there's tons of ways that a butterfly can be in that forest. And you end up with a wide variety of species like Jamie shared with us uh, from these uh, uh, amazing rainforests. So great question. That's a complicated one. Um, Miss Moore's class, who, by the way, had Wiley, who was creative swan in our leaderboard. So way to go, Wiley. I'm going to head to you guys in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Unmute your mic. Come and join us. Hello, guys. Hey, Jamie, we have a quick question for you. Our question is, what is the rarest butterfly? Ooh, no pressure. <laughs> I don't know what the rarest butterfly is. Oh. Off the top Before of my head, I would need to look up that information. Yeah, this is where Google comes in very, very well. See, this is the thing. We've got um, insects in general are really poorly understood in terms of their distribution and their amounts compared to things like mammals. Because as you might imagine, it's easy to go to an ocean to go whale. It's easy to go to a, a forest and go gorilla. It's very hard to be like, how many butterflies are here unless you're able to sample the entire rainforest? So there are certainly endangered insects, but that's a very tricky question, Jamie. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, they are much harder to study. And um, like I said, there's like over 180,000 species within the order Lepidoptera. So, and that's just the ones that we know about right now. There could very well be many more that we don't know about. Well, this is the thing, and I always like to highlight this when we have rainforest programs and deep ocean questions. Every single time, and I literally mean every single time we go to a rainforest and we do a study of the wildlife there, we find new species that no one has ever described before, ever. That happens every time. So it's amazing. If you want to be a biologist, you can go to one of those two ecosystems and just be astonished by the diversity and find things that are new to science. And so uh, probably many butterflies are there. Probably butterflies with one of them left, but hard to track down exactly who that might be. Let's head to Orangeville, lovely Orangeville from his Penfold's class. Come on in, guys. Hey. Hey. All right. Um, oh. Can butterflies communicate? Ooh, good question. Ooh, good question. Butterflies can communicate with each other through a couple of different, like, um, they can, some can con communicate through, like, chemical signaling. Um, so when butterflies are, like, trying to attract a mate, they may um, put out chemical signals or pheromones um, that other butterflies of their species can sense. Um, they may communicate through their movement. Um, so there's a couple of different, just like people have multiple ways of communicating with one another. It's not just language. It's also like, um, our body language gives communication cues. Butterflies also have a couple of different ways that they communicate. It just looks different than us. We had a person on talking about pheromones the other day on one of our broadcasts. And I always like to highlight for people that, you know, we're not used to pheromones as a way we don't use pheromones. Well, we do douse ourselves in, in body spray and perfume and stuff like that. But we're not used to pheromones as a way of communicating, but more kinds of animals on this planet use scent to communicate than use sight, than use anything else. And if people look up butterfly dances and some of the ways that butterflies do mating rituals with one another, it's really, really cool as a follow-up to the broadcast today. So great question, guys. Oh, there's so many of you. I let in the maximum number of classes and it's mass chaos. You guys, there's just so many great questions. Miss Edie's class, we're going to head to Asheville, also in North Carolina today, and then we're going to head back to California for Miss Sussman's group. Miss Edie's class, come on in. <laughs> Um, so we have raised a butterfly before and um, she hatched late and we, I was at, I wanted to ask if, um, would she make it to Mexico? Ooh, good question. I don't know. Your butterfly, what, what kinds of butterflies were you raising in your classroom? We raised two monarchs. Cool. That's awesome. I don't know what kind of health that butterfly was in. You said that she hatched a little bit late. She was really know. tiny. She was extraordinarily small, but she we we gave her some orange so that she had some nectar because the purple she aster would, she was would get the purple aster. So we're hoping that she did well. She took an extra week to form in the chrysalis, and um, so we're hoping. <laughs> Noting too, not all of them end up in Mexico. Some end up in uh, the United States. So could head there, could just live out its life. It takes multiple generations, if I'm not mistaken, for the butterflies to actually get down and get back. Like it might not be the same butterfly, but either way, I think we can safely say, Jamie, that the butterfly will be fine and live a happy life wherever it ends up. Absolutely. It sounds like you all did such a fantastic job caring for that butterfly. I'm so happy that it was in your care. 
<laughs> so cool to have that. Like, I never had anything like this when I was a kid. Jamie, we had to walk uphill both ways in the snow. I'm sure you did too. You've been in Missouri. So it's a, uh, it's a tricky, yeah, kids, you guys are really lucky. And again, we're going to get a bunch of resources to keep the excitement going after this. We are at the 40 minute mark. So we're going to whip through these. I hope no one has to leave. We'll might be a little longer. We'll be rebels together. Uh, but Miss Sussman's class, come on back in for your second question, fifth graders. Hey guys. Hello, my name is Eileen. And my question is, so when butterflies fly up to the sky, does that mean that they're in danger? Or oh, are they in danger when they fly up? Yeah. Oh, I mean, there's many reasons why a butterfly might fly in an upward direction. Are you are you feeling worried that it might be in danger because it's flying away from where it might find flowers? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, it could be it could be that that butterfly is trying to move to a different location. It could be that it is trying to escape a predator. It could be that it is moving in a way to try to attract a mate. There's many many things that could be going on. So without some like additional context clues about what's happening in that environment just from that one type of behavior i i don't know well hope not i i think you can safely assume if you see a butterfly going up probably not in danger at that moment but i like the the thought behind the question guys this news glass back to you you're like right in the camera hi <laughs> how, long, how long does it take to become a butterfly oh from a from a caterpillar <laughs> So yeah, how long does it take to become a butterfly, Jamie? Um, it can be um, anywhere from like one to two weeks. Some uh, chrysalises or cocoons will stay, uh, the butterfly will stay in them for longer depending on uh, the environment. So if a butterfly is living in a place with a more extreme temperature, it may kind of wait out like a period of cold in a chrysalis and then hatch during warmer temperatures. It really depends on the species and where that species lives. So I want to note, I know we've got a couple North Carolina classes. You guys have the North Carolina Museum of Natural History, the Southern Ontario groups. You have Niagara Region and their Butterfly Conservatory. Uh, our California friends, I wish I knew offhand, uh, but there's a butterfly. Anytime you get the chance to go to a butterfly conservatory, you'll see a whole chrysalis room or area. It's one of the most magical things in the whole world. To see that and to see a butterfly coming out of one of those is I mean, Jamie knows this. It's like one of the coolest things on the planet. So I hope you get that chance to check it out and they'll have specific info about the various species, but it will it will differ. Great question, guys. And I want to give a, a brief shout out to um, one of our community partners, um, the Butterfly House of St. Louis, the Sophia M. Sachs Butterfly House has partnered with us on a couple of the videos that Jesse's about to share with you. Um, all of the footage that you saw in this presentation was taken in their conservatory and they have a fantastic website and lots of different resources that you can learn, continue your learning over there. I'm going to get people the website and I'll put it in the chat for everyone too, but very, very cool. Um, let's head for our final four questions. Stony Plane, we're back to you guys. Come on in, Miss Smith. How fast can butterflies fly? Ooh. I would fast. need to Google that question. I would need to look that up. How fast they, can they fly? That's gonna depend um, on the size of their body, the size of their wings. I found this out, Jamie, you, you, you guys are asking like the most, you know what, I love kids because you guys were just like me when I was growing up and it's all superlatives. Fastest, biggest, coolest, strongest. The fastest butterfly ever in the world, uh, and this is verified by the Natural History Museum in the UK are skippers. 37 miles per hour they can fly, which is way faster than I think we would have thought. That's crazy. I'll link this in the chat for everybody too, but super, super cool. Um, I've got so many things to link in the chat. It's it's half my fun. Miss um, Penfold's class, we're gonna come back to Orangeville and then we'll wrap up. What is the coolest looking butterfly you've seen? Ooh, there you go, a personal there one. You go. A personal one. When I was walking through the rainforest in Costa Rica in August, I saw some blue morphos and they are such an iconic uh, rainforest butterfly. It was really, really magical to see them just out in their natural habitat. Um, something I share with classes that I visit, if you ever use like someone's phone with emojis on it, the blue butterfly in the emoji app is a blue morpho. So they're pretty ubiquitous, pretty famous butterflies. So it was very cool to see one in its natural habitat. 
my favorite are monarchs. I grew up with them. They're spectacular. I hope everyone gets the chance. If you get the chance to go to Mexico in your life and see the butterfly forest, it's one of the most magical places in the world. Uh, and it was certainly one of the coolest trips I've ever had the chance to do. So check out the butterfly forest in Mexico when you're done. It's just, it'll blow your mind. Uh, Miss E's class, we're coming to you for one final question. Thanks so much, everybody. You guys have been a great audience today. Uh, come on in, Global Explorers. <laughs> Well, we don't have a question, but this is the uh, butterfly. Oh, monarch! Winter was a caterpillar. He's so cute. That's adorable. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Well done. It was smaller than my thumb. It was tiny. And we're planting monarch um, butterfly. Um, Oh yeah! Dude, what is it? What is the name of the plant? Milkweed. 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 We still have a moth egg. We're there. growing. Uh, there we have a moth in that Holly egg over there. Famous. A Holly famous moth. Cool. And it's a silk, silk egg thing, but it's supposed to. What name was it? It doesn't hatch. It um. It stays in its cocoon for months. I, I'm going to play in the back because we're getting near the end of the broadcast, but it's extraordinary that you guys are taking the effort to care for butterflies, moths, showcase this widely. I want to encourage our classes. Jamie, you talked about that final Kahoot question about planting a butterfly garden. The best organization I ever heard for finding things that are local to you um, that you should plant, it's called Pollinator Partnership. So I'm going to put this in the chat. They're an extraordinary group that works for butterflies and moths. This has been a big feature at the local uh, big a biodiversity conference right now is pollinators. So if you want to look up their work, they have a lot of stuff about if you're in Missouri, if you're in North Carolina, California, Ontario, the local plants near you that you can plant to attract local butterflies. Jamie, this has been so much fun. There's so much to cover. I'm going to send every one of our classes a huge message when we're done this. Is there any final message you want to share with us before I bring in our classes to say thank you and farewell? I just, I so appreciate you all spending time with us today, and I really appreciate your enthusiasm, your questions, and your personal stories about butterflies. Thank you all. Thank you all. Miss Sussman's class, Miss Lou's class, Edie, uh, Miss Edie's group, we've got... <laughs>